everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer for Billboard, Access.com, Variety, and other publications, welcoming you to another installment of Things We Said Today, our weekly chat fest about the Beatles' past, present, and to come. Let me introduce my two co-hosts. First of all, up in the state of Maine, our musicologist, a man who has written for the New York Times, for the Wall Street Journal. He has a book called The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and another book called Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. Mr. Alan Cosen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. And in Connecticut, we have the host of the Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, uh, and uh, a man who loves Paul McCartney and loves uh, Beatles solo music and is not afraid to just say it, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. (laughs) Hi, Steve. Uh, Okay. I love all four of them. Yes, you do. You you don't have to single out Paul. Okay, you do. You do. And um, I don't want to forget that I also have uh, am the author of the book Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Our special guest this week is Harold Lapidus, the author of Friends and Other Strangers, Bob Dylan Examined, and we're going to talk about the Beatles and Bob Dylan. But we're first going to get some news out of the way that's happened uh, this past week. One of the, it's not a big piece of news, but uh, the Shout Factory announced that uh, the movie Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is coming out on Blu-ray. And I was surprised. I mean, I wrote a, a small piece about it, and of course it's not the greatest movie in the world. At least the audience didn't think so. But I was surprised at the mixed reaction. There were some people that were very glad to see this coming out on Blu-ray, and there were other people that were just saying, no, please don't. Um, <laughs> guys, uh, I'd like to hear, first of all, what you guys think. Ken, you first. Um, I never thought it was that great a movie. Actually, I know a lot of people bashed it. I thought it was okay. You know, the the people who were hired to play the parts were not real actors. Uh, The Bee Gees are not really actors. Peter Frampton's not an actor. But I I enjoyed it. You know, I especially liked all the cover versions of Beatles material, Mm -hmm. especially Earth, Wind & Fire has got to get you into my life, which was a major hit. Aerosmith had come together, which which came from the movie, you know, and I like the appearances of having Billy Preston in there. It's nice to see him. Yeah, uh, when it comes to cover versions, you have to have Steve Martin's cover of Maxwell Silverhammer. That's an absolute must in anyone's uh, uh, catalog of uh, Beatle covers. Um, I like having George Burns in the movie. You know, Alice Cooper's in there. Uh, it's a harmless film. I think a lot of people bashed it. Probably unnecessarily. It's not a great film, but you know it serves its purpose, and I do like the covers. That's mm-hmm. about it. Okay, Alan, what do you what do you think? Uh, hmm. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I got it when it's out on VHS, and I got it when it was out on DVD. But you know, planning for the future, I've been thinking. You know, when I get really old, there's going to be some. Beatles related stuff that I haven't seen yet and I'll want to see it then. So I haven't bothered watching it ever. I'm saving it for my old <laughs> really? age. Yes. I I've, I've heard the covers, you know, because of the soundtrack album, you know, is out, but I, I actually haven't been that interested in seeing Sgt. Pepper the film for some reason. Have it <laughs> sitting here ready to watch as soon as I can, you know, screw up the interest to see it. But um, Mm. that hasn't happened yet. I have to say I've played the film in the background and listened to the music. I I do like the music, but but yeah, I mean, it's parts of it. Parts of it are bad, but it'll be I mean, you know, I'm not going to condemn it all the way. I think there are worse films. I, I think somebody on Facebook suggested if it had been a concert, it would have been better. If it had just been a straight concert, uh, I don't know if that would have you'd have been able to do that. But yeah, I mean, it's it's it, I mean, it is what it is. It it, it it's not as bad. Be- I think uh, I guess Frampton really can't stand it, from what I understand. And mm. uh, but and and you know, I mean, and it, it's got all the it's got all those people at the end. You know, George Martin is there at the end, and and uh, you know, there's whole the whole big crowd at the end of. Uh, that they gathered on the uh, the lot to to do the that last scene, but 
you know, mm. it could be it could be worse. Um, the bad thing, uh, or the disappointing thing about the Blu-ray is that there isn't any outtakes or there is a um, commentary track. I understand, but that's about it. So, oh well. Yeah, I'll probably watch it as a double feature with all this in World War II, which I also have never bothered watching. Now that so, is okay. horrible. <laughs> that is terrible. Huh. That is really, really horrible. I, mm. I couldn't sit. I couldn't sit through that. I could probably sit through Sergeant Pepper, but uh, all this in World War Two and the re- and the thing they just the re-edit they just did are just tremendously terrible. Yeah. Just well, in fact, you know, maybe what I'll do is I'll watch those two, and then as a palate cleanser. I'll watch Magical Mystery Tour, and it will seem spectacularly there, you know, there you sensible go. film. Uh, there, you so. go. There, there you go. Now, now. now. There you go. Um, Ringo, Ringo issued um, his first single this week, and it's We're on the Road Again, which happens to be with a certain Mr. McCartney. Mm-hmm. You can hear Mr. McCartney's voice in there. That's the lead track off the new album, Give More Love, which I uh, have mentioned online – as a great track, and uh, a lot of people now that they've heard it agree. Um, now that you guys have heard it, what do you think, Ken? You, I'm sure you, you did. You hear the track this week? Yeah, I love that song. Isn't that you know, great? It's it's a great rocking song, and I love the the guitar riff in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ringo co-wrote it with Steve Lukather, and uh, I think Joe Walsh is on there too. He is. And uh, it's really a good opening song, and and I sure hope that he does that one live when the All Stars. I uh, do, I do too. I, I, I'm going to reveal a secret here. I interviewed Bruce Sugar about a week and a half ago, and I asked him that, and he said it's a possibility that they would. So, cross your fingers, folks. Let's hope. Mm-hmm. Let's hope. You know what? When Go Postcards ahead. from Paradise came out. Mm-hmm. And the opening cut was um, Rory and the Hurricanes. Mm-hmm. I thought, he's got to do this one live. It would really translate very well live because it's a good rocker. He never did it. Right. <laughs> so I, I was really shocked that he didn't do that particular song live. And so, there was one There was one on the one of the earlier albums, and I can't remember the title of it now, that when I was talking with Edgar Winter, I said the same thing. And, and they didn't do that either. So I don't know. You know. Ringo doesn't like to change his set list. He's like Paul. He doesn't go for a lot of changes, but they might. Maybe they'll they'll throw in the one to uh, to promote the album. I hope so. Alan, what do you think of the song? Um, I liked it. You know, I, I liked really pretty much the whole album. Um, mm-hmm. um, I, I didn't. I don't really think in terms of singles. I noticed that it was announced, but I, I just think of the whole sequence of songs and and uh, you know, I like it. It's a good. You know, as you say, it's a good opener and. Uh, just a good track so Mm -hmm. yeah more better more than the title track which was the first thing that they were were teasing with yeah that right that seemed slightly weak to me it sounded a a bit like a lot of older Ringo stuff but it Mm -hmm. that may actually be the weakest track on the album um Mm -hmm. all the rest uh, I I really enjoyed so yeah yeah. Oh, I, I I do too. Uh, uh, having listened to the album several several times now, I I, I agree. It's it's a uh, that is a great track, and and our uh, the first track is a great track, and that and the track you're referring to, yeah, is is weak. And I was surprised they actually threw that out as a teaser for the album. You know, that's that was very strange to do yeah. that. Yeah. The title track I think is a very pleasant song, but it sounds very close to Never Without You. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Melodically. If you listen real carefully, right. So. Mm-hmm. And then I also did a another McCartney set list watch this week, and again, nothing to report. I mean, he's still interchanging the fourth song, uh, "Jet" and, and "Letting Go," and uh, "Get Back," and "I uh, Saw" uh, and "Birthday." Excuse me. So nothing, no big changes uh, on the set list yet. Yet. We will we will hope. And one final one final very minor note for those of you um, out there: um, the Rolling Stones are issuing a 50th anniversary edition of Satanic Majesty's Request. Another instance of where the Stones follow the Beatles. Of course, they're not at least <laughs> according to according to the now the I have not seen a full track list. There were. It's, um, it's just the stereo and mono album. I don't is, think is there's that, any yeah, extra well, stuff. Well, I saw apparently a press release may have come out this afternoon, and I haven't seen it yet. 
but yeah, there, there's a the the listing I saw had a four had a, a four disc vinyl set of or two disc vinyl set of yeah stereo and mono, which really doesn't make any sense at all. But I I really wouldn't want to hear outtakes off that album either. So I don't know why they're going to all that trouble. It's yeah. really not really not worth it. Uh, well, if you some, if you did want to hear outtakes, there's like a you know an eight or ten disc bootleg set. <laughs> Mm-hmm. called satanic right. sessions so um yeah not a lot to see there and the you know the stones themselves have done nothing but sort of trash that album especially keith um mm-hmm. you know so we we can't totally say that they're being hypocritical putting this out because this is the stuff owned by abco and they have no control whatsoever um on it and and, uh, this is, and it's really an abco money grab that's what this is yeah so. yeah But it's coming out with a lenticular cover and all that stuff. So if you missed that for the first time where your old one is trashed um, and you Mm. really like the album, which I kind of do. Sorry, Do you really? Yeah, I really do. Um, and it's funny that that uh, the Beatles put the lenticular cover out on Pepper. Yeah. That kind of was that kind of a statement there uh, (laughs) to the Stones? Yeah. I don't know, but anyway. um, Okay, let's. Welcome our special guest, uh, Harold Lepidus. Uh, uh, hello, Harold. Hello. Hello. Thank you for uh, having me. Oh, you're 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 very welcome. Harold and I go back a ways. Back in the days when I had the Abbey Road website, Harold was one of my contributors, and I don't remember asking you to do a blog. Did I? Did I do that? Did I? Yes, you did, and you said. <laughs> I can't pay you anything, but it would be really cool if you did. <laughs> and uh, that was one of the things that um, led me to uh, continue writing. I, I used to write for a wow. magazine called uh, Boston Rock uh, in the uh, early 1980s. Mm-hmm. And uh, just life got in the way. And then, uh, thanks to Steve, I got writing again. Well, is that what happened then was after I had joined up with the examiner, with examiner.com to become the Beatles examiner, he joined uh, Examiner.com and became the Bob Dylan Examiner. And some of the stuff you used to come up with was incredible. I mean, uh, there were connections that I never even would have considered with Bob Dylan. But he just put out a book, a collection of his um, writing, Examiner writings called Friends and Other Strangers, Bob Dylan Examined. And it's got several pieces about the solo Beatles um, – uh, in there, but you have seen all. Of, you've seen all of the solo Beatles, correct? Uh, yes, I. Um, I saw John Lennon at the One to One concert in 1972, the Late Show. Saw George in '74, and at the uh, Bob Dylan tribute in 1992. Uh, saw Wings. Saw Wings, and then saw whatever the 1990 tour, and a couple of times in 1999, it saw a sort of invite only private kind of things and then you know plenty of times with the, this new awesome band that he has and uh, Ringo I've seen a few times as well you saw Ringo's first tour the uh, 89 tour with uh, um, Leave on uh, Helm, Leave and, Leave on Helm and, and all those guys yeah. you saw the Dave Edmonds tour and you said you saw the Colin Hay tour it was either 2002 or 2003 but um, I remember I took my son which was uh, my eldest son my uh my father took me to see John Lennon and George Harrison, the first George Harrison, because I was uh, too young to go by myself, I think, in those days. So mm-hmm. um, so it was kind of cool to pass that along. Okay. You also had lunch with Rusty Anderson in 2002, and you met John Lennon. You told me, uh, you told me uh, when we were talking before, correct? Right. I, I met uh, – right. Uh, the um, Rusty Anderson, um, uh, a former roommate. His sister was married to a musician named uh, Parthenon Huxley, and I think Rusty played with him. So he just they just knew each other, you know, way back in the day. And you know, he had plenty of other success, like he plays the guitar on um, "Living La Vida Loca." And he's, you know, Rusty Anderson did a lot of things. And uh, so it just happens that he, uh, through uh, someone, you know, uh, we went to take him out to lunch that day before he played in um, I think Hartford, and. Uh, you no, know, he's just could, nice as can be. He told me, told us some stories. You know, nothing uh, salacious, but uh, he's a. Uh, <laughs> um, I thought one of the interesting things. He's one of those guitar players that can seems like he can play anything. Mm-hmm. And he told me that um, Paul handed him a, a double CD of songs to learn, and he just thought, "Well, I know all these songs." And then he got the CD and thought, "Well, I guess I don't know some of these songs." And he had to learn. 
<laughs> <laughs> Ken, you, you had a question? No, it wasn't a question. I was going to say that you're very fortunate that you've gotten to see all four Beatles separately. I don't know too many people that have outside of my wife, and she also got to see the Beatles live. So, you know, because of the fact that there are so few concerts that John did solo-wise, and with George, you only got the 74 tour and the tour of Japan, the end of uh, 1991, and a few sporadic events, to say that you saw John or George, and both of them, you know, many people have seen Paul and Ringo, but to say you've seen John and George and all four Beatles, that's, you know, it's kind of rare. It really is. Yeah, I used to watch um, Eyewitness News, uh, Channel 7 in New York, and Geraldo Rivera was uh, an investigative reporter, and he mm -hmm. was reporting on Lenin's uh, deportation case a lot, as you probably know, and uh, as well as the, uh, the Willowbrook School, and he would just um, report on the horrible conditions there. And uh, he, uh, one day we're just watching, and Geraldo Rivera announced there's going to be a one uh, benefit concert with John and Yoko and Stevie Wonder and Roberta Flack and Sean and I and my sister and I both yelled, you know, can we go? Can we go? And my my my, my father just had this like poker face and it's like I I just figured it would just sell out. And then um, back in those days, this is uh, you know the summer of 1972, and we lived out on Long Island, and there wasn't a Ticketron anywhere near us. So mm -hmm. he, so he called uh, a friend of the family in Queens, and she just went and bought three tickets for us and we got seats behind the stage and you know it, it's a show that could you know can never be surpassed i mean i've seen other awesome shows but it, it was there's nothing to compare it to and i know there's the video which is mostly from the afternoon show and um but uh the evening show you know it could just be my innocence or whatever but it, it, it was just it was so intense and he was just you know it was a year after imagine and two years after let it be and there he was and him and yoko and it was just uh it was it was just amazing. Hmm. Was it the whole experience of everybody, including Stevie Wonder and Roberta Flack and Sharana, that made it special? Or was it specifically, you know, what well, was your was, main focus on John? Well, it's definitely to see, you know, a Beatle, which, you know, in those days, you know, a Beatle on giving a concert was incredibly rare. But it was, you know, I did like Shauna and I knew who they were. I knew him from the Woodstock movie. Of course, I knew Stevie Wonder. It was. I remember him walking around the stage because I didn't know that. I was pretty young, and I and we both we all knew he was blind, but we, he was walking around the stage and going from the drums to the keyboards or whatever. And yeah, he, he was like a greatest hits uh, set, and he ended it with a superstition, I think, which was just brand new or is about to be released. Hmm. And uh, then then a Roberta Flack came out, and I just remember it was getting you know past our bedtime because John and Yoko didn't come on till midnight. And she did a very slow set, and you know it was good and everything. But we're, at that point, we're going, well, you know, when's when when's John and Yoko going to come on? Yeah, and then uh, and uh, they had this. Um, I just remember they had this uh, lighting system that only I think the Rolling Stones used, where they had uh, these mirrors on the stage, and they had the spotlights going up to the mirrors and shining down on the band. And but we also the mirrors meant we could see better because we were behind the stage, and. Um, you know, but it was just this really crackling electric guitars and everything, and and I don't think the recordings ever captured that. It it, it was just really, really loud and really almost like a heavy metal kind of guitar sound. And uh, the recordings that I've heard haven't really um, captured it. But you know, John would do all these songs, and you're just wondering. You know, I was there to see John Lennon, the solo artist, because uh, I I was not expecting to see a Beatles concert, and I thought. You know, maybe he'll do a Beatles song. I thought maybe he'll do Battle of John Yoko. And then, um, as I'm sure you all know, he came out and did um, Come Together near the end of the set. And, uh, you know, said, uh, come together right now, stop the war and everything. And everyone cheered. And it was just it was just so intense. And, you know, it's just like great song after great song. And and, and uh, sometime in New York City, just come out. And, you know, I, you know, he's John Lennon. And I, I just loved those songs, too. I, and uh, you know, he opened up with New York City. And it was just. It's just like you just couldn't believe he was there. You just couldn't believe he was in the flesh right in front of you. It was hmm. Thing. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, Alan, you, you were at that show, right, Alan? No, I wasn't. I was at Bangladesh. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Wish I was. I, you know, that <laughs> show sort of was like right after I left New York to go to school in Syracuse. So wasn't even in town for it, alas. Mm. Mm. Alan, did you want to ask uh, Harold a question? You were talking about meeting John Lennon. You didn't get to that. No, no, I didn't. I didn't meet. I didn't meet John. I met Paul. Oh, okay. I thought uh, Steve yeah, said yeah. you had, had met him. I must have misheard. No. Okay. Yeah, I met Paul at, at um, in 1999 in October. 
Uh, I worked, as I said, I worked for a record store in New England, and, and everyone in, at Capitol Records in New York knew what I was a huge Beatles fan. And uh, in October 99, there was a, a Buddy Holly dance party thing, and everyone kind of knew Paul would show up, but he wasn't announced. And uh, I went uh, I went down there, and he came out and did a rave on with the uh, crickets. Mm-hmm. And it was, uh, you know, it was worth it to go all the way down there just for that one song, really. And then they gave you a little poster and T-shirt on the way out. <laughs> and uh, it was a... Um, it was only a year after uh, Linda died, and he, he, you know, he looked, you know, kind of frail. He looked like, you know, and uh, I, I don't. He didn't even come back at the end. I think he was, you know, I'm not sure what it was going on, but I don't think. I mean, I loved it, but I'm not sure if he had a particular had a good time. But then a, a couple of weeks later was um, a Run Double Run uh, sort of record release preview. Right. So uh, John Fugel sang was interviewing him on stage, and uh, then they played the whole album. People at Capitol Records said over by the stage over there you're going to meet paul after the show so i waited there and uh it took forever uh woody harrelson and charlotte crow were around and supposedly they were in another room doing something whatever before <laughs> and we were waiting for them to finish that and originally we were supposed to all get individual photographs and all this sort of stuff and he finally comes out and it was like you know meeting royalty we're all, we're all lined up and it was about the fifth person there and uh i just thought you know, I don't want to blow this. I don't. Want, it's my one chance to meet Paul McCartney. I don't want to say, say anything stupid. I'm just going to say, th- thanks for the music. But the first four people all just said, thanks for the music. <laughs> and and, and I, had, I had flown in from Boston, and my flight was canceled, and I had to get another flight, and I, had to, you know, I got a cab, and I just got there in time, and I was all stressed out. So uh, he you know, reached out his hand, and I said, I just flew in from Boston, and he just opened his eyes and said, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and that was kind of that. And then um, you know, and, and, and then they, there was a big. Um, I did bring a, 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 a Paul McCartney CD in case you know he was signing autographs or I'd meet him. Uh, but there was one guy before me from a let's just say a competing record store, and he went up to Paul with a Family Way seven inch, and Paul said, "Oh, what's this?" <laughs> well, he said, "Well, it's your first single, Paul," <laughs> and um, and so he signed it. And then he wanted something else signed, and Paul just said, "Well, that's a bit greedy," and that was the end of that. So I didn't get an autograph. Um, I could have, like, he just said, you know, I could have forced it, but I just said, "He's Paul McCartney, whatever." You know, yeah. I'm not gonna, I don't want to ruin his day. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And then uh, we've got this big group picture, and then um, through the magic of Facebook, I found out there was another picture of me of Paul, and in, in the, you know, it was just sort of like a photo bomb, the picture. Uh, which I didn't even know about, and um, that was my big experience. Mm-hmm. Oh, good, good for you! Congratulations. So, in the book, you um, you have chapters devoted to um, Dylan's sort of relationships with each of the Beatles, and you sort of list a lot of the you know interactions and or you know songs that where that the Beatles did, or former Beatles did that had to do with Dylan or vice versa uh-huh. and uh right uh, that was that was that was kind of interesting i mean how did you um like do you have a card file or something that has <laughs> all this info or did you just um you know collect it at the time you were writing the column uh well a lot of the things um i just remember it's like i'm like you guys it's just like i was a beatles fan way before i was a dylan fan uh i was um i like the beatles since i was five uh dylan baffled me by the time I got into music other than the Beatles and the monkeys. Dylan was doing lay lady lay and I just didn't get it. I just didn't, I didn't, I, I looked at him and said, what does this have to do with the guy on the cover of blonde on blonde? I just like, yeah. just seemed like a totally different guy. And well, you know, Dylan, Dylan like, does that a lot, doesn't he? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I got used to it now, but it, it was, you know, <laughs> and I had a friend, um, uh, he was my next door neighbor when I was a little kid and he was that one actually, I just remember, in, it must have been February 64, I was playing in the snow next to him at the swings, and he just said, you know, the Beatles are hip. And I just said, <laughs> yeah, the Beatles are hip. And I didn't even know if I, how I knew who the Beatles were, but, you know, I had my parents get me, meet the Beatles, and, you know, just fell in love with them, and, and so on. And he, but he got into Dylan, and he was trying to get me into Dylan for years, and I'm just saying, this guy is just too weird. I, you know, I just don't get it. And um, uh, for my birthday, and then there's the concert for Bangladesh where, you know, I couldn't believe two Beatles were playing a concert together. And uh, when I read about it in the newspaper, Bob Dylan was just as big a news story as two Beatles. And that, you know, piqued my interest. And then when mm-hmm. he went on tour in 1974 with the band, my friend Danny got me 
an extra ticket, and it just totally uh, broke down any walls of whatever I had of what the limitations of music could be. And so I went on a big, uh, you know, Dylan jag, and uh, just um, started, uh, you know, just you know learning all about him. But also, it never left any of the Beatles solo stuff either, and any little reference to. You know, Dylan's Mr. Jones, or just, or like, you know, Dylan just singing like a Rolling Stone and dig it, or um, and scared, and or he does these little Dylan imitations here and there. He's obviously had this sort of mixed uh, admiration and competitive streak with Dylan, uh, particularly. And uh, you know, he, you know, you know, John, you know, I love John, but he would kind of contradict himself and say he thought he was great, but then I didn't listen to him after Highway 61, and he would just say things back and forth, as I'm sure you all well know. And, uh, but of course, then there was the George Harrison connection, and particularly, and that, uh, obviously, everything, at the end of 1968, he went to visit Dylan in Woodstock, and he had a great, with Dylan in the band, and had a great time, and then he came back to the Let It Be sessions, and he was miserable. Right. And he said, that that's one of the things that, you know, and plus you'd be singing Dylan songs during the, the, the sessions as well. Right. Uh, so uh, there, there are all these connections, but also a, a Wings Wildlife uh, that was, Paul went in and said, well, Dylan records these albums really quick. I'm going to do it too. So there's all this kind of connections here and there, and it's back and forth too, you know, because obviously, you know, it helped Dylan decide to go electric and all that. So right. they're just going back and forth forever. And, you know, even on... Uh, uh, Dylan's last album of original material, Tempest, the last song was a, a, an obvious tribute to John Lennon. Mm-hmm. Mm. So what did you make of, um, you know, as a, as a Dylan fan, when John did Serve Yourself, um, obviously a reaction to you got to serve somebody. Um, did you, were you, how did you feel about that? Uh, well, the first thing was a friend of mine had it on a cassette before I bought it on a bootleg mm-hmm. and he he wasn't even sure it was john he had his doubts mm. and um because it was a bootleg you know you never know who, who you know who's on what uh but uh i just thought it was hysterical i love john's sense of humor and i'm and um i just thought it was clever and funny and there have been like slower versions on piano and stuff which mm-hmm. haven't been released but i the only thing that struck me as a little weird when he told john to go wash your ears or whatever it was he said yeah. at the end. It was like, I thought that was a bit weird, but as far as a, a parody of Lennon, I mean, he was doing that all the, you know, as I said, periodically for the years. And I just thought it was hysterical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think, when, um, I think Sean was in the room with him and he, he was talking to Sean right. at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Not expecting us to be listening. Right. Mm. <laughs> Do you happen to know Harold, how Dylan felt about that parody? Did he ever make uh, it known? I don't think he ever commented on it, but uh, supposedly, I mean, that that was uh, that came out around, or it was obviously it was recorded around 1979. The Dylan version was in 78, so I do know that supposedly, you know, you never know anything for sure. But uh, it's been reported that in uh, January of 81, I know John went to visit. I mean, uh, Bob Dylan went to visit Yoko at the Dakota, and uh, I guess to pay respects or uh, to you know, console her or whatever. Um, so I doubt one of the things that I think hard for us to understand is, uh, you, these people are just so famous and they're just so used to so much stuff and they're just, they have, they're always, you know, ragging on each other and making fun of each other and teasing each other in the press. And that's how they used to even get publicity back in the day. It's like, if you say something terrible about some other band or another band member, you got free press. And, and, uh, so I think that's something that's embedded in what they do. So they, they just kind of make fun of each other and, that type of thing, and uh, like Dylan did a a, a song called um, "I Want to Be." Was it? It wasn't. I want to be wanna your be lover. Your, yeah, I want to be your lover, right? Which is kind of like yeah. a parody of "I Want to Be Your Man." Right. So, um, and uh, when uh, George asked uh, Dylan to do his old stuff of Bangladesh, Dylan said to George, "Well, why don't you do? I want to hold your hand." You know, and end up doing his old stuff. But there, there's this, you know, that kind of fame. It, it, the way they think about this stuff, I think it's a lot different than if someone made fun of us on a record. We might think, "What the hell?" <laughs> hmm. Hmm. When when do you think that the the Beatles and uh, the for Beatles and Dylan first? Um, I, I, I don't want to say became aware of each other, but when was there a connection between the two? When do you think that started? Well, I know uh, there's actually a picture of them in the Beatles in Paris in. January 64, where they're holding a copy of the Freewheel and Bob Dylan. And uh, just to, for 
the uh, trivia freaks there. It was like the British version. It wasn't the French title. It was the, it was the uh, you know, it must have been a British copy. Mm-hmm. And I guess they played it nonstop. They just uh, just loved it. I mean, I've heard them say they loved the first album too, but I think people, I don't know if that's true. And uh, so that was that was the first time the, the Beatles really got into Dylan. And Dylan was driving cross country somewhere where he heard, I want to hold your hand on the radio and just thought it was just, like this mind-blowing thing and of course the, you know the famous story goes that he thought they were singing i get high i get high instead of um, i can't hide and uh, that sort of changed the world <laughs> wow um is is the um al Aronowitz, um meeting next is that the next thing that happens yeah um it was during- explain explain who for people who don't know who al Aronowitz is explain who he is I'm trying to remember. I know, basically, he was a. I guess he was a journalist, and mm. he. Um, I don't. Off the top of my head, I don't remember that much about him. But I know he. The most famous thing he probably did was uh, bring Dylan to this hotel to meet the Beatles, and uh, I guess they had to. Again, some of this is just from memory, and uh, I don't have the facts right in my hand. But I think they had to put towels under the doors and make sure there was no, uh, no, no, uh, no way for any evidence for anyone to, you know, get them to leak trouble. out. Yeah. yeah. And um, I guess I'm trying to remember. I think Dylan's a pretty bad joint roller. <laughs> I guess he made one, and um, he. Uh, I guess he gave it to Ringo, and Ringo just smoked the whole thing up right away. <laughs> and, um, somehow, that. somehow, I don't think Ringo. I can't picture Ringo as the one that doing that. Uh, you know, I, like- I think I think John's referred to him as my royal taster or something. <laughs> yeah, he had to go first because they and, and there I think there is evidence that they actually smoked pot earlier in Germany uh, right. a couple of times, but um uh, they didn't stick with it or whatever. I didn't certainly didn't think of it as anything that would be a, a creative tool <laughs> the way they, they did it. Um but yeah then they all started um getting high and after that and I probably learned the etiquette of not keeping it all to oneself, <laughs> passing it around and pro- proper etiquette. That's still cracking me up. <laughs> but they, they would all laugh. And then that's why they would say they would have a laugh. That was their code for saying they would get high. Hmm. Okay. Inter- interesting. How about the, the George Harrison, him and the friendship of him and George Harrison? Where did that kick off? Well, um, I know, for instance, when, George went to India in, I know when he went to India the first time, I guess it was 66 or 67, or he brought all this, all these Indian music uh, records and Blonde on Blonde. That was the only rock record he brought. Mm-hmm. Um, he was just, I guess he, I guess if you're in the Beatles <laughs> and you're looking for something else really good, I mean, you got to reach pretty high and uh, no pun intended. And um, so uh, the, uh, that was what he connected with. And then, uh, I know he was there in 1968. Uh, I don't know if there was any time in between that, uh, between his, uh, you know, Dylan in the summer of uh, 1966 had a, it fell off his motorcycle. How big an accident it was depends on whatever mythology you want to believe. Some people think he was really hurt and some people think it was a way to get out of those pressures and contracts and everything else that he had uh, he had going on. Like he was supposed to write a book called Tarantula, which he got a contract because John Lennon had a successful book within his own right. So they wanted to write a book too, and I think after a while he was just kind of felt like it was more of an obligation than anything else. But um, anyway, so definitely the, the one time I know for sure was that uh, he visited, as I said, in Woodstock, and there was a remember there was a there was a bootleg where they do everybody comes to town and an early version of um, I Have You Any Time, and I think he wanted to help him uh, get back to. You know, being a performer, uh, supposedly songs like "Behind That Locked Door," "Behind That Locked Door" is supposedly mm-hmm. about um, Bob getting back uh, in action. And I'd have you any time, according to Livia, was uh, which she wasn't around at the time, but said that that was um, a way of, um, to, and again, an invitation for uh, Bob to get back in action. And the fact that he invited him to Bangladesh was another thing. It was, uh, you know, similar to what Pete Townsend getting uh, Eric Clapton uh, uh, passed his heroin addiction and getting back in things. So good. There was a lot of uh, camaraderie and friendship. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, you know, it seems natural for someone like George, such a, a spiritual person to want to help someone, uh, get back on track and, uh, get back in the world. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you kind of you kind of answering my question here, but it always intrigued me why, you know, John and Paul were looked upon as being poets of their generation, and George was certainly blossoming at that time too, and Dylan was a poet of the generation. Why George gravitated the most towards Dylan than the others? But you were also saying before that you kind of felt that with John, it was there was a competitive thing. You really think that he felt competitive with Dylan? Yes, and um, but, well, it, it, you know, it's one of those things that I don't think it can be easily defined. Like there was the on the Pussycats album, uh, it was never uh, you know Harry Nelson uh, for those. I'm sure everyone here knows, but there was an album called Pussycats, which John Lennon produced for Harry Nelson. And he said he chose some of the songs and, and Harry Nelson chose some of the songs. And I have a pretty, I would guess that that was uh, Dylan, the Dylan song, uh, Subterranean Homesick Blues, was John's suggestion because of that, you know, him admiring that kind of thing. But also if he's uh, the other, you know, genius of that time or whatever you want to call him, then, then, it, then it's, he's being compared to him all the time as well. And, hmm. uh, but, uh, it, you know, he said, you know, I don't believe in Zimmerman and even earlier it was, you know, I don't believe in Dylan. And, uh, you know, he, he would reference him, uh, periodically here and there. And, you know, there are other kind of references to obviously other riffs and songs and Chuck Berry songs or whatever, but I don't think there, I can't off the time I had think of any other contemporary artist except for Paul, where he would write about or the mm-hmm. other Beatles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that John and Paul never really did work with him, and it was mainly George doing all of it. Yeah, you know? get, well, there's a, there was a rumor, and because you know you hear all these rumors, you know, as, uh, and there's a rumor that in 1969 during the Isle of Wight concert, when three of the four Beatles attended uh, this rare, you know, one-off Dylan concert at the Isle of Wight, uh, Paul didn't go because uh, Linda was about to give birth, one of those the same day or something, but. Uh, uh, around that time, uh, I think I'm trying to even remember, but I think they may have played tennis together or they hung out together or whatever. But there was a rumor that Dylan played piano on a version of Cold Turkey. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that was a rumor from back in the day, and mm. could easily been made made up. But uh, yeah, the um, but of course in uh, Eat the Document, there's uh, John and. Dylan in the back of the cab, and right, uh, and there's that big, that, uh, you know, there's, there's a few minutes. It's like a minute in the film, but it's like a ten minute stone drive. <laughs> at least mm-hmm. John was, at least uh, Bob was stone. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so they would hang out. But it, 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 you know, it is weird. Like it takes someone like George, I think, to to bring things together because his. I, even though I'm sure he, you don't get to be a Beatle without having a certain amount of an ego, but um, he was a, a supportive player. Like when the Traveling Wilburys because he organized it, it worked. And Bangladesh worked because he was in charge of it. But if you, but he knows how to be, work with other people better, I would think, uh, more than uh, uh, where, uh, let's say, Paul or John, I would think they're more leader types and um, they are more uh, into being in charge and so on. Hmm. Could I ask a couple of questions here about two specific songs? Yeah. Um, one of which is I Don't Want to Do It. Mm-hmm which uh, we know that George rehearsed during the All Things Must Pass sessions, and then later on there was the release version that came out uh, from the Porky's Revenge soundtrack, Mm -hmm. which Dave Edmonds produced. But that's the song that that Dylan didn't release at all. What's the story behind that song, and how did George discover it? Well, uh, again, this is based on what they said, which I always question even if the source says it but uh, when uh you know i think dylan just gave him that song and if not for you uh or heard them or whatever back you know and when he went to visit him in 68 or somewhere around that time and uh when george decided to record it according to the press at the time dylan hadn't even copyrighted it they had to <laughs> copyright the song specifically he just like it was, just, it was a throwaway song to him and he had to copyright it uh, so George could uh, release it. So that's all I know about that. And um, one thing I found out relatively recently, which you guys may already know, but the seven-inch mix is totally different than the uh, CD mix of um, "I Don't Want to Do It." Mm-hmm. Right. Like that. Yeah. So that that was kind of cool to find out mm-hmm. years later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the other song, which still hasn't been released from George, is "Abandoned Love," which is really a, a great bootleg <laughs> recording there. Uh, which dates from, I guess it's around 1983 or so. And the story that I heard was that it was a song that Dylan 
had written around the time of Desire, and it was supposed to be on the album, but he shelved it. Is right. Um, yeah, he first performed it, I think, at the other end, or you know, when he was rehearsing or getting the Rolling Thunder idea. Rolling Thunder View was a tour that he did at the end of uh, 75 and early 76. We had uh, Joan Baez and Joni Mitchell and all these people, Ramblin' Jack Elliott. And um, he was just getting it all together, and one night he, he went out and did that song at a uh, Ramblin' Jack Elliott gig, and it was an early version of the song. And then uh, he recorded it for the, um, for the sessions for Desire and left it off, and it ended up on, I think, Biograph or something. And oh, yeah, uh, and uh, George, you know, I've heard that, I'm not sure where I heard that George version, but yeah, George does an excellent version. George does all his Dylan songs great. I mean, that's mm-hmm. pretty, pretty I good. don't know what it is, you know, it just say, it seemed so natural for him to do Dylan. Yeah. And you just reminded me when the Early Takes Volume 1 uh, CD came out, there's a version there of Mama, You've Been On My Mind. Right. And I had never heard that version before. Do you know where that's from? No, I remember Giles Martin explained those things because there's no liner notes on that album at all. I know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but it was interesting because there was that. There was, um, I think it was Behind That Locked Door on that album too. Yes, there's a version of it on there. Right, and then there's also Let It Be Me, which Dylan also covered. And those three, I think those three were in a row, and I thought that was interesting that, you know, they were put there together. But, uh, yeah, I also, but also, Mama, you've been on my mind, I'm pretty, like, he did it at the Get Back sessions, too. It's like it's something mm-hmm. that, um, he's mm-hmm. been doing, you know, solo versions of that forever, yeah. So, but yeah, it's, it, it fits his style really well. Oh, Definitely. Yeah, definitely. I would have loved if he had recorded a whole Dylan album. <laughs> All he Dylan may have. <laughs> That's true. He may. He may very well have. Well, I suppose yeah. he used to take. Uh, he used to take bootleg video things of Dylan concerts. Really? Yeah, he used to take a camera with him, and you know, from the side of the stage, to videotape uh, Dylan shows. Wow, wow. Where is that footage now? <laughs> Prior Park, I guess. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, Harold, you told me about a story that uh, you knew about a, a Denny Sywell Bob Dylan connection. All right. So um, at the end of the very end of seven, uh, first of all, the reason I brought that up, in, in case anyone's heard this, listening to this, and hasn't gone back and heard the Denny Sywell uh, interview that you guys did, you know, I would definitely suggest listening to it. It's my favorite thing you guys have ever done. It was just you know, oh, jaw dropping. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. And, and um, so he was obviously Wings drummer and Paul McCartney's drummer until uh, Band on the Run. And so in late 77, he was going to be Dylan's drummer. Dylan was going on his first world tour. Um, he stopped touring in 66, and he'd never toured places like Japan before. So he was going to do a world tour. He got divorced. It's a long story. But um, he, uh, he, uh, so he's going to go on a, this big world tour, and it's going to start off on, in Japan. And so this is two years before the... Paul's famous bust in, in Japan, but um, he uh, he was at the rehearsals at the very end of '77 and at the beginning of '78. But then he was having he had visa problems because of his Paul McCartney's whatever drug busts he had before. He could not wow. get a visa to Japan, so they picked up Ian Wallace of King Crimson. And so he they went out they went out with him instead of Denny Sywell. Right, so he went on a, 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 a tour all around the world and. Um, there are some interesting stories about that. Katie Segal, or whatever that actress is, she was originally supposed to be a background singer too, but uh, really, she sing. yeah, she couldn't sing. <laughs> I guess. Wow. Yeah, they had three singers that weren't particular professional singers, and they kind of didn't last very long. But yeah, that was another controversial <laughs> tour. But it's more it's more Dylan trivia than I can't think of any particular Beatles trivia. So, huh? All right. Although, although I, somewhere on the tour, the, the the backgrounds, one of the background singers, one of the on one of the shows did "Long and Winding Road." I remember that somewhere in Europe. Really? Yeah, they would take a little break and have the the background singers sing. Mm-hmm. In your book, you talk about um, in in the section about Dylan's relationship with Paul McCartney. Um, you talk about all the you know discussions mainly in the press about how Dylan and McCartney were going to do something, and um, you quoted McCartney saying, you know, he'd like to work with Dylan. And then you have a later quote from McCartney where he says basically, yeah, I I sort of said that I'd like to work with Dylan, and he didn't get in touch with me. I mean, I can't get in touch with him. That's not cool. And I'm wondering what he meant by that. 
<laughs> yeah, that's uh, get, not getting in touch with Dylan is is a, a very common theme. <laughs> yeah, he surrounds himself. He insulates himself so much. I mean, I I don't know how you get involved, how you get to be in his inner circle, but whatever it is, it's very tight. And you know, he has many people just asking him the the meaning of life, all you know, for decades. You know, and he just right. doesn't really want to. Presumably, you know, if you're Paul McCartney, you can get through. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure if he really wanted to, he could. I know, I remember when uh, Warren Zevon was recording his last album, I think he was trying to get in touch with Bob Dylan because he recovered uh, Not Gonna Have So and he couldn't do it. And I heard in a recent interview, Robbie Robertson said he couldn't get a hold of him. So I don't, I just, I just think he doesn't really need to get in touch with people, hmm. you know, whatever. And, um, but he ended up doing that, a cover of um, Things We Said Today on that. That's um, true. Right. That tribute. But, um, yeah, and I say, and uh, and uh, just on a, another you know, minutia point, uh, in uh, on uh, 1966, Dylan had a the phrase in a song, um, "The county judge holds a grudge," and of course, right. another round, he says, "The uh, county judge held the grudge." But yeah, they um, he, and uh, more recently, uh, and and uh, that Paul McCartney question and answer thing on his website, they asked him what song he would do. And I think he was saying uh, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall is one of the possibilities or Mr. Tambourine Man. I can't, I can't remember the exact answer right now, but um, he did address it. So, But, you know, again, it's one of those, these incredibly famous, successful people, you know, their kind of problems that we can't really relate to. You know, it's like, how could you not get a hold of Bob Dylan if you're Paul McCartney? He's like, I don't know. But um, I'm sure if you, I, I, I probably didn't want to seem too needy either. Uh, you know, it's like he's Paul McCartney. It's like, why can't Bob Dylan call him? Uh, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You also mentioned in in your book an incident where uh, George Martin Dylan connection. That yeah, when George Martin died a couple of years ago, they kept on saying he worked with Bob Dylan, and I could not figure out what that connection was. It took me days to actually figure it out. And um, in 1994, there was this uh, concert in Japan where Dylan played with an orchestra. And he did three songs, and then uh, Johnny Mitchell and the other people on the bill came out and, and sang a finale. And I guess George Martin did the live sound for that show. And um, so if you for the live broadcast, that's George Martin's connection. It, 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 there's actually one of the songs was released on a CD single, and George Martin was not listed as a producer or anything. So it must have been a different mix. But, yeah, that's the only uh, connection I could find. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Cool. Any any uh, any other questions, you guys? Yeah, I have a few. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead, Ken. Yay! I wanted to bring up the concert for Bangladesh because, as you know, George said that um, he didn't know until the last minute that Bob Dylan was going to show up, and yet there's rehearsal footage that we've seen, and it was even on the DVD as as bonus footage of them rehearsing. If not for you, what's the whole story behind that? Well, that, it reminds me also, similar of the Traveling Wilbury story, the exact history, because every time they tell a story, it's a little bit different. <laughs> you know, it, it, I mean, supposedly, I think Phil Spector said Dylan was going around in a circle on a bicycle backstage all nervous before he came on. And uh, George Harrison's set list just said Dylan, question mark. <laughs> I mean, I, I, they could have easily not shown up, I guess. I guess it was I, – and I, I'm – I think uh, it was in the DVD where they said uh, they hadn't even rehearsed the whole concert in order from beginning to end. It was, it was just so last minute to, to try mm. to get it all together. And then, uh, yeah, and then uh, Dylan did come out. And uh, yeah, as I said, uh, in uh, 1966, he had the motorcycle accident. He, in 1969, he did this big concert, the Isle of Wight, which got uh, universally panned, really. I mean, they just because... You know, they were, the ex- expectations were so high, and it, he was the country guy, not the you know rock and roll rebel anymore. And people, and he came on, you know, wait, you know, people waited for hours and hours and hours, and so he just had enough of that, and he was just a bit shy about getting back on stage. It's like, mm. who, you know, who needs that hassle? You know, it's like he does If you notice, he after Live Aid, I mean, he showed up at Farm Aid just to sort of reclaim his sort of reputation a little bit, but he doesn't do those things anymore. He's like, why, why would he, why, he doesn't need the aggravation. You know, he's the big star. It's all this pressure. And, you know, he's, you know, he just rather play theaters and, 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 and all that. But uh, yeah, it's like the, the, when you hear about the, the traveling Wilbury story, every time I hear it, it's slightly different, you know, and, and uh, you know, people like us want to know exactly minute by minute what happened, but 
we know the general story, but every time it's a it's a little uh, someone changes it a little, embellishes it a little bit, and. Um, mm. Does the whole idea of, of Dylan even being involved in something like that seem foreign? I mean, I I was very surprised that he even got into that. I mean, I can you can kind of see George, you can see Jeff Lynne, you can see Tom Petty, you can probably see Roy Orbison, but Dylan was, I think, the the, the wild the, card, right? Yeah, yeah really I was. I was I was surprised. Of course, when he did it, he's the one who kind of took it over. He has by far the most material. And according to some of the interviews, I think Tom Petty said he would be sitting there with pads of paper and Dylan would just be scribble, 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 scribble. And everyone else would be just kind of writing a little bit here and there. But uh, I think he liked the idea that he's the one who instigated the volume three. I think it was his idea. And he, they just sort of did it whenever he, they could. It wasn't as unified as the, the previous one. It was more mm-hmm. organized. Mm. And I guess and one of the stories, if you read the, uh, I think it was in the Carrie Fisher section of my book uh he wanted to start some uh traveling wilburys hotels or something <laughs> really yeah i mean it's one of those things that you know it's a story you know he says things like that all the time he's i mean the thing about dylan and one of the things that helped me understand what he does is like you just wonder what is he kidding and then you go yes he's kidding and then when you when you think about that you know when you when you think of what he's doing and realize even though he's this you know serious artist and everything he's he's basically you know hysterically funny in many ways he just says things just uh just because he has a bizarre sense of humor you haven't had any personal encounters with him i take it no aside from seeing him like 80 times (laughs) in concert nothing nothing closer than that now i met his son jacob he was very nice i met him a couple of times and he was he was very nice no mystery nothing mysterious uh, about about jacob no, he was he was very friendly. I knew he was a he was a fan of the Clash. So uh, the first time I met him was back in the days of cassettes, and I gave him a you know there's there was a, an unreleased Clash album, and I gave him that on cassette. And he was very nice about that. And then uh, <laughs> there was a, a Clash DVD, live DVD, you know you couldn't buy, <laughs> and um, uh, back before I think people downloaded stuff. And um, you know, and I uh, I had him sign some posters for my kids who were you know teenagers at the time. And one of my sons is the same name as one of his brothers. And he just said, oh, you know, that's a good name. You know, and I didn't say anything. It's like, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, mm. same. But, um, yeah, I didn't say, wow, you know, your dad's great or anything. I'm sure he doesn't want to hear any of that stuff. I just, uh, you know, plus I like him as an artist anyway. I think he's really good. Mm. Just like, and I, cool. One of the things that I, I really like, too, is um, how Sean Lennon has matured into this, like, amazing sort of psychedelic, you know, guy. I mean, he was remember when he was a little kid he was you know he was like in the spotlight and he seemed a little nervous and you know i liked his early records but he didn't really have i don't you know he just seemed kind of um tentative and you know you can almost feel the pressure and now he just seems really confident in everything and just i'm just so happy for him he has a, this this great career hmm. yeah i'm very impressed with sean i mean he does things on his own terms he works with anybody he wants to you know, he does uh, soundtrack music to films. He doesn't seem to care whether or not his music sells or not. He's just doing it because he loves it, and he's comfortable in his own skin now. I think, you know, he's, in the very beginning, in the very beginning, you know, he he couldn't handle, you know, the fact that he was Sean Lennon's son, and there's there were a lot of questions directed about John, and you know, he wanted to be established by himself. Now he just does whatever the hell he wants. He he works with whatever friends he wants to. And, you know, he's, he's living the life as a musician that he wants to, not caring as much about record sales. You know, I think you can attribute a lot of that to Yoko, because, I mean, Yoko obviously doesn't give a damn, you know, how people look at her, and, and, and he's the same way. I mean, that's one thing you can say uh, that he's probably picked up from her. I mean, I'm sure he's picked up a lot from John, too, but, but that's one thing that they have in common it's it's interesting right she's fearless and uh yeah, he's uh he picked up on that mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. could i ask one thing about the traveling wilburys here because so, i want to know i've never read anything to the effect that would tell me what the intentions were of the band beyond even even the first album i mean i'm sure all four all five guys admired each other so much they enjoyed working together it was a laugh you know, they had this great sense of humor and everything. And if Roy Orbison hadn't died, I know they made this second album, but was there ever any talk of this? Because the first album did so well. Mm-hmm. Maybe it being an ongoing thing. Well, I just, I think it was, 
I just heard a, I think it was a Jim Keltner interview. It must have been Jim Keltner. And he said they were all ready to go on tour. And then you figure one person was going to say no, and that would be Bob, Dylan. But it was actually George who pulled the plug on it and said, I don't want to do it. No. Nope. Really? Yeah. <laughs> but I was going to Jim Keltner. Which and, mix? Uh, you know, he was there. Yeah, or whatever, you know, whatever, whatever Wilbury name he is. But um, uh, yeah, so, uh, but they were planning on uh, doing something. And uh, then um, I guess George decided he didn't want to do it. Hmm. Uh, That's the yeah, first time shame, I've heard this. Uh, Jim Keltner said. Well, they had they had worked with um, uh, who uh, I can't remember his name now. Began with a D. Del uh, Shannon. Del Shannon, right? And I think there was a, wasn't there a rumor that Del Shannon was going to take was going right, to. That, that was a rumor, and I think also Carl Perkins was a rumor. But I don't know if anything right. was actually going to. I don't. You know, I don't think Carl Perkins was a likely likely possibility because he was much older um, than Shannon. Uh, right. So I don't. I don't. But I'm, yeah, but yeah, Tom Petty produced the Del Shannon album, and, you know. Right. And he mentions him in the songs and everything. Obviously, that was his one of his main uh, influences. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, yeah, that that, that would have been interesting if if Shannon had been in there. That would have been that would have been fun. You know, I think that, that 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 that's what they were trying to do at that uh, Bob Fest thing at the end was kind of have a Wilburys kind of uh, finale there with um, Petty and Dylan and George Harrison mm-hmm. with um, Clapton and Neil Young and mm-hmm. and Roger McGuinn. Now Roger McGuinn would have been great. That would have been that would have been fun too. Yeah, uh, but there's so many, there's so many possibilities. Yeah, right, right. But anyway. were they were they seriously talking about Del Shannon? You know, I, I I have a feeling it's more rumor than anything else, but uh, you know that's an, that's a an name that keeps getting floated around, Ken. I yeah. mean, every, anytime you've heard somebody, you know, becoming a member of the Wilburys, that's really that's the name that I've heard is Del Shannon. Yeah, I've so. heard the rumor many times, but I never heard anything to confirm it. Well, yeah, I Bob never, never heard... answers my phone call, so I don't know if I can get an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good, um, uh, Harold. This has been this has been a blast. Um, well, thank you for having me. This I, I love. Yeah, I love the Beatles as much as I love Dylan, and uh, and it goes back much further. And, uh, and as I said, uh, I love your show, and um, I thank love you. listening to it. So um, I'm glad to be on it. Thank you very much, and um, hopefully we can there, hopefully we can get you back sometime for uh, you know to talk about uh, Bob again. Um, to get a hold of us, uh, you can write to us about this show or any of our past shows uh, at uh, Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. You can listen to us on Fab Four Radio on the weekends. We're on YouTube. We have you can download us on Podbean. I want to take a special uh, note to thank um, Matt uh, and um, Alan for on on Fab Four Radio and Pure Pop Radio for for running the show uh, there. Uh, and to we've ne- we never ever we always forget Michael Lynch, thank you for our theme song, sir. You, yes, you see, thank you, Michael. We we do we do remember you, Michael. So there you go. Um, <laughs> you can get a hold of us individually. We're individually on Facebook. I have a Beatles news and information page. Alan, where do you, uh, you can you can write to me directly at beatlesexaminer at gmail dot com. Alan, uh, your contact information, please. Yeah, you can get to me on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Okay, and Ken, your your uh, contact info, please. My email address is every little thing at att dot net. My website is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Every week there's Beatles trivia. You can win one of nine prizes. And uh, that's every single week. Okay. Uh, CDs, DVDs, books, you name it. They're tremendous prizes, and there's always a winner every single week. So visit the website. All right. Thank you, Ken. Um, Harold, where can people get your book? You can get it from uh, Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Those are the easiest places to get it. And okay. it's called Friends and Other Strangers, Bob Dylan Examined, and my name is Harold Lapidus, <laughs> and um, L-E-P-I-D-U-S. So, uh, and, it's, and it's available in both print and, and ebook form, correct? Exactly, yeah. Okay. All right. We thank you. For Harold Lapidus, Alan Cozen, Ken Michaels, and myself, Steve Marinucci, we thank you for listening to Things We Said Today, and we'll see you next time. And come back again. Mm-hmm.